Dr. Kane, you are up. All right. Well, thank you very much and good evening, uh, Madam President DiMaggio and fellow board members. For the record, I am Andrea Kane, Superintendent of Schools. Um, and I am here to present tonight the superintendent's budget request. So, um, and Mr. Paluski is going to be my able assistant. And at the end, I'm going to ask for my exec team to come forward to respond to any questions that are posed. So, the purpose of today's presentation is to give the board and the public some background information on revenue and expense patterns over a period of time, funding from the county and the state, maintenance of effort, and per pupil spending. Uh, then we'll talk about the projected costs for fiscal year 2019. Um, as you can see before you, I just wanted to outline a couple of points that uh, represent our budget process. So as you know, this past fall, we administered a budget survey to our community and we heard loud and clear from several, uh, several respondents. We have tried to um, anticipate some of those uh, requests and throughout the budget process and uh, we'll talk about uh, those a little bit later. Um, December through current right now, we are meeting with our bargaining unit, so I would like to say um, which collaborates uh, Ms. Fields' comments earlier today during public comment that we are not finished with negotiations. You will see some estimates um, in this budget request, which really are placeholders representing requests that have been made from the bargaining units. Uh, January, we analyzed and shared results of that budget survey. January and February, we held meetings with schools and um, departments of central office regarding their budget requests. January and February, we worked on uh, um, the budget or we had budget work sessions through uh, with our school board members <coughs> March 7th we um, are presenting tonight the superintendent's budget request and we have uh, March 13 a draft budget will be submitted to our commissioners the budget overview just some broad overview points the Queen Anne's County Public Schools FY 18 operating budget is 96.7 million which is an increase of 1.8 million or 1.9 percent over the fiscal year 17 budget our local contribution was um, no more than the minimum level required by maintenance of effort in FY18, Queen Anne County Public Schools received $374,712 or 1.1% of additional state aid, uh, while grant funding from the federal government decreased by about $564,000 from, from the prior year. Grants and other restricted funds total $6.6 million for FY18 operating budget, a gain of $96.7 million. So I'm going to provide a little bit of background. As I stated before, this presentation is not only for, um, for you, uh, board members, but it is also for our, our listening public in an effort to keep everyone informed and, and be absolutely transparent about this budget process. So what we're looking at right now is a graphical representation of the county's fiscal year 18, um, the current year's revenue budget. As you can see, a majority of their revenue is generated through property taxes. That's almost 50% followed by income tax revenue, which is about 37%. This graphical representation of how the county allocated their budget for the is um, for how the county budgeted for the current fiscal year. As you can see, the Board of Education receives about 41 and a half percent of the county's budget. The next largest slice goes to public safety, uh, followed by debt service and then public works. The uh, general government, as you can see, is about 7.46 percent, and the allocation to the school board um, is the lowest percent of county county budget, I have to say, that has been received. We'll show a little bit uh, more trend data regarding that. This slide is similar to the last slide, but it shows how the county's budget was spent 10 years ago. So this is for fiscal year 2008. At that time, um, the Board of Education received 46.77%. Now this one is for 2003 and it goes back 15 years just to show some trends of how the Board of Education's um, portion of the county budget was indeed at that point 50.59% and as you can see <coughs> the portion of the county's budget allocated to the school board um, has continued to decrease over time. So. Uh, there are some other areas that have um, shown a little bit of fluctuation, um, public safety 
and public works were increased, both of those, by about 3.5%. Um, the school system decreased by about 9%, just over 9% over the last 15 years. The um, allocation of, as a percent of the county's actual um, expenditures. This slide shows the decline over the past 20 years. As you can see, 1997-98, um, the school system received almost 54% of the county's budget. Now, that was a long time ago, and, and finances were different, I have to say. Um, but in 2017-18, we received just over 41%, as I mentioned, and that's a reduction um, over the last 20 years of about 12%. This table supports the figures that you saw in the previous graph. As we start at the bottom, fiscal year uh, 98, the school board received 22.6 million of the, counters, of the county's 42.2 general fund expenditures, or 53.5% approximately of the budget. Um, in fiscal year 2018, moving up, the school board is slated to receive about $55.5 million of the county's $133.8 million budget, which is um, about 41.48%, as I mentioned before. This slide shows what Queen Anne's County Public Schools holds in fund balance. I thought it was important to uh, show what we hold in fund balance, and it represents the end of fiscal years 2014 <coughs> through 2017. Fund balance is a term, of course, that we use in accounting to report the difference between revenues and expenditures over time. These are the only funds available for emergencies, a contingency, or one-time cost. There are two lines that make up our fund balance, just to explain this graph a little bit more, the assigned and the unassigned. The assigned fund balance are funds that we hold in reserve to cover costs such as annual leave accrued but not yet paid, encumbrances from purchase orders outstanding at the end of the year, and future insurance costs. The the unassigned balance are the funds that we have to cover any unexpected costs or budget overruns. As you can see from this table, our overall fund balance averages about 3%, but our unassigned fund balance is usually less than 1% of our total budget. Each fund balance is made up of several items. Ours is unassigned and assigned, and the county has assigned, unassigned, and rainy day. These pieces make up the total, and the amount that's assigned to, for us is leave accrued but not paid, insurance reserves and encumbrances, as I mentioned just a moment ago. This information, I want to say, was taken from the Department of Legislative Services overview of Maryland local governments, and it shows the same information from the, for the county government's fund balance. Their total fund balance runs between 15.3 and 19 percent, just about, and increases each year since uh, between 2014 and 2017. While the unassigned fund balance runs between 6 and 7 percent, um, there is also a rainy day fund, which trends right around 7 percent. Um, and this shows a, a little bit of a significant increase between 16 and 17, from 7 percent to just over 11 percent. So let's talk about operating fund and uh, revenue and expenditures for the school system. The graph that you're looking at right now shows where our operating fund revenue comes from. As you can see, we rely on funds from the county for over 57 percent of our operating revenue. The state contributes about 35 percent of our restricted funds, um, and we make up about 7 percent. And the remaining percent comes from miscellaneous uh, sources such as building use and interest income, the retiree drug subsidy program, et cetera. This table shows the actual dollar amounts for our operating fund revenues for 2017 and 2018. I wanted you to see a little bit of a comparison and what the difference is for the two years. Unrestricted county funds represent maintenance of effort. In 2018, maintenance of effort, as this, graph show, as this table shows, was roughly $55.5 million, which represents an increase of $1.3 million or 2.41 percent beyond the 54 million from the previous year. 
This increase represents the required amount that was to be allocated due to increased enrollment, and we'll talk more about MOE shortly. The state allocation is based upon the formula for state aid broken down in our budget by foundation program. Um, and transportation grant is included in there based on the number of students transported from school, uh, state compensatory aid, uh, which is for students that qualify for free and reduced meals, uh, limited English proficient students based on our number of students that don't have English as a, um, a primary language. Um, special education is based on the number of students that qualify for special education um, services. All of that is part of the state allocation. Uh, restricted funds, uh, they come to us from grants designated for a specific purpose. The majority of our federal funds are for special education and for Title I. We also have some other funds, as you see on the table, that are also restricted funds, but those funds are used to support the Family Center and majority of the Partnering for Youth grant. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about maintenance of effort. I have a quick little video here, and I hope that we can put that microphone up to the speaker so that we can um, get some sound. Is that one working? Okay, let's. All right, let's. This video is a, a good example of the explanation of maintenance of effort, and I actually think because there are graphics to it, it can do a better job than I can than to explain maintenance of effort in layman's terms. So let's take a quick look. Me, MOE. Hi there, I'm MOE. MOE stands for Maintenance of Effort. The state of Maryland law signed in 1984. It requires local governments to provide, at a minimum, the same level of education funding per student from year to year. MOE sounds like a solid plan to protect da, education da, da, da. funding, right? Well, not exactly. Maintenance of effort is a misnomer. MOE only maintains the same level of educational services if costs remain the same, and costs rarely stay the same. Prices just keep creeping up. We all experience this with our own personal finances and monthly bills. So while the MOE law provides for funding at the same amount per student from year to year, it does not account for the rising costs of educating students. MOE does not address inflation, wage increases, and the rising price of goods and services, such as fuel, electricity, health benefits, textbooks, computers, and other school materials. So with costs rising every year, funding at the maintenance of effort level actually means reducing our level of support for our students. I didn't know that. Well, it's true. Let's say we have a school system with 2,500 students with local funding per student at $10,000. This school system receives $25 million from its local government. Assume the next year that enrollment stays the same. If funded at the maintenance of effort level, the school system would receive $25 million again. But assuming an average cost increase of 2%, the school system would need $25.5 million to provide exactly, but no more, than what they are currently providing to students. So, they are half a million dollars short. By strictly using the MOE equation, this school system would need to make budget cuts. The same per student funding actually equates to less goods and services. And this equation does not account for the need for new programs, initiatives, or new strategies. When enrollment increases, the MOE law does provide for additional money per student as provided in the prior year but it does not fund the additional money needed for the rising cost of educating all its students. This budget shortage could lead to larger class sizes, reduced services, and less student programs. While maintenance of effort gives us the floor or the minimum for education funding, it should not be considered the funding ceiling. We must factor in rising costs and the growing needs of our students so that our children receive the education they deserve. Okay, so maintenance of effort, uh, in a word, is uh, a funding level that we know is imposed on the counties by state law. The law requires county governments to provide as much funding as they did in the prior year on a per-pupil basis. So 
For example, and I'll just give another quick example, if we had 1,000 students and the county funded uh, $7 million, then that would equal 7,000 per student. In the next fiscal year, if we had 1,001 students, they would be required to fund an additional 7,000 or $7,000,000, $7,000. But of course, you know, things are not that simple. We realize that. In uh, 2012, the state law changed. Um, the county is now also required to meet an additional condition called education effort. The education effort is calculated by dividing the appropriation given to the school system by the county's wealth, expressing that as a percent. The state then compares this percent to the five-year statewide average percent for all counties and determines if we meet or exceed the average. If we do not meet this test, then the county is mandated to increase the MOE by the lesser of three amounts, the percent increase in the total wealth, wealth per pupil, the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil, or 2.5%. In fiscal year 18, Queen Anne's County, along with 12 other counties, did not meet the education effort criteria. Therefore, an additional amount of MOE will be imposed for fiscal year 19. When evaluating the three factors, those three bullets that you see before you and that were on the previous slide, it was determined that the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil was the least of the increase at 1.5%. So this was applied to the required per pupil allocation. I wanna note that education effort is MOE. There is no other interpretation. Education effort is MOE. It's required by state law and it is not an additional amount allocated over MOE. It is MOE. Here's the calculation for MOE for fiscal year 2019. We start with the prior year's highest allocation, so that would be fiscal year 18 allocation, which is 55.5 million approximately. This figure is divided by the prior year's September 30th enrollment to determine what the FY18 appropriation per pupil would be. Since the education effort was not met, that per pupil appropriation is increased by 1.5%. This gives us the adjusted per pupil amount, which then gets multiplied by the current enrollment to determine what the new MOE figure is for FY19. The difference between the current allocation and the future is the increase in MOE. Those are the additional funds that must be allocated to Queen Anne's County Public Schools for fiscal year 19. And you can see line F there represents the additional um, increase for us, which is about 1.3, um, almost 1.4 million. And that's due to an increase in enrollment. So over the past 15 years, the county um, has generally exceeded MOE um, in their allocation to the school system. There were only three times in the past 15 years that the county funded the district at or below MOE. And this graph represents the percentage over or under MOE that's been allocated to the school system. So the yellow line in the middle, point zero, represents the required MOE. The red line shows the percentage above or below MOE, which has been funded by the county. As you can see, for fiscal year 12, um, in the, the only in that year was the district funded below MOE. In fiscal year 11, and again in fiscal year 18, we were funded at MOE, level with MOE. And while it's difficult to see on this graph, the fiscal year 13, it looks like it's right on that line, but really it is funded slightly above, and I think it was something like 0.25% above MOE. And that is um, reflected in um, the next table. So this table shows the actual dollar amount that, were, uh, that I talked about in the previous graph. The figures in red represent um, the years in which the county allocated funds at or below MOE. And you can see FY12 um, is there and at MOE for 11 and 18. In January 2018, the um, MSDE released the preliminary state aid calculations, and based on their calculations, we will receive an additional $329,000 some odd dollars, as you see um, on this table, for fiscal year 18, um, 19. So some uh, project projected increases in the funding that we anticipate. 
I want to be certain, certain to share this with you in the public um, so that you can understand how we project those increases. And we're looking at um, required increase in MOE for FY19, and that's that $1,389,120, as I mentioned in the previous slide. The projected additional state aid, as I just mentioned, for $329,338. And the category of other funding is represented here. It has to be reduced by 264,413 because that's the amount that was deducted from fund balance in FY17 to balance the budget for FY18. So once that amount is removed, the total estimated increase in funding for FY19 is $1,454,045. So we'll move on and we'll look at our expenditures. According to state law and the MSDE financial reporting manual, we are required to submit our budget to the state with the expenses distributed in the above categories. This is, um, as you can see, the majority of our budget is allocated to instruction as it should be. The second largest allocation is employee benefits. Our total operating budget is $96,780,105. This pie chart shows how our operating budget is allocated in percentages. Of course, this chart reveals that 77% of our budget is in instruction and special education. It also includes transportation and associated employee benefits. That represents about 77% of our budget um, focused on our students and our employees. Um, please note that the administration portion, it's that small sliver of green up at the top, is 2%. And while I am new to the district, I sometimes hear uh, comments, um, and I want to dispel the notion that we have a bloated central office at 2%. That certainly is not bloated. Mid-level represents principals and assistant principals, and that's just over 5%. You can see instruction at 40, just over 40, um, and the rest spell out special education, student support, employee benefits, transportation, um, and that, that rounds us to just over 77%. Also, according to the uh, Maryland State Department of Education Financial Reporting Manual, each of those categories must be allocated to the following subcategories, or objects, as MSDE refers to them. Salaries and benefits account for over 80% of our budget. And I want to just be sure to explain a couple of the other items there. So certainly salary and benefits you see, but those contracts for $6.9 million, about $5.2 million of that is represented by our bus contracts, and um, the majority of the remainder is in special education-related services. About $3.3 million in other, you see those other charges there. About $2.7 million is utilities and graduation expenses, mileage, athletics, um, all are part of that category. So I wanted to make sure that you understood what was in those categories. This graph simply depicts the previous slide showing the portion that each allocation by object represents out of our total budget. So as I mentioned, salaries and benefits account for about 80%. The third largest portion is in contracted services. So we have to talk about how much does it cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County? Well, this table breaks it out for us. This data was obtained from the most current MSDE fact book, which was issued in 2014. And at that time, the cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County was $11,935. As you can see on this graph, a majority of that cost is in instruction. The second highest cost is fixed charges, which are employee benefits. And those two items account for about 70% of the total cost to educate a child in Queen Anne's County. I want to note that that 2% for administration equals about $239 per pupil. And the mid-level for principals and assistant principals represents about 5% and about $597 per pupil. So together, that's about 7% of our pu per pupil allocation. And, and just as a side note, uh, of those $11,900, uh, about $6,400 or 54% come from local funds. And the state funds approximately $5,000 or 42%, and federal grants fund the remaining $500 at about 5%. 
This graph, um, the yellow line represents the state's average cost per pupil, the state's average cost per pupil. The red line represents Queen Anne's County's cost per pupil. And as you can see over time, our cost per pupil is drifting further and further below the state average, where back in 1993 and 94, the, um, Queen Anne's County spent about 97% of the state average. Uh, by 2014, we're spending about 87% of the state average. So by now, the point is the public and you have some facts. At this point, the question then becomes, are Queen Anne's County public school students being afforded educational opportunities that are at least average, right, in comparison to other state students across the state? The yellow line on this graph shows where the county ranks as far as wealth per pupil. In 1996-97, the county was the eighth wealthiest county in the state on a per pupil basis. From 2006 to 2011, Queen Anne's County was the sixth wealthiest county in the state. And the latest data on this chart shows Queen Anne's County as the seventh wealthiest. Now, ironically, during that same period, we slipped from 11th in the state and what we were able to spend uh, per pupil um, to 24th. Queen Anne's County spent the least amount per pupil in the state in 2011-12, 2012-13, and 2013-14. This data is the last information published by Maryland State Department of Education in the fact book. So we've reviewed our data from the Department of Legislative Services that indicates why while Queen Anne's County continues to be the seventh wealthiest county on a per pupil basis, we fluctuated over the past several years from 20th in the state to the current rank of 22nd on per pupil spending. So let's move forward and take a look at our budget requests. Again, I'm gonna... <coughs> somehow... Yeah, okay, good, we're, we're okay. So again, I'm gonna state that we are not finished with negotiations. I wanted to include these slides as placeholders so that you could have some understanding of estimate cost, estimated costs for negotiated contracts. So a, uh, a step increase would amount to about $1.3 million. 1% COLA would be about $625,000. And the cost for a loss step would be uh, just over about nine hundred or $947,147. Uh, 2.2% percent would, be, um, would equal $335,581, and that would be the cost to uh, fund a 2.2% increase for employees who are not eligible for a step increase because pretty much they're at the top of the scale. You see information regarding the cost for health care premiums. Active employees is about $705,000. Uh, retiree insurance is about $150,000. And that is refer representative of a projected increase of premiums at about 4.5%. We have requested some staff, uh, just so that you are aware. When we met with staff as part of our budget process, we uh, got about a request for about 35 positions. Um, over the course of time and, and after crunching and crunching and crunching and, and really taking a close look at our resources and how effectively we're using our resources, we were able to narrow that list down and to what you see before you. So we're asking for a total of eight new positions for fiscal year 19. The, um, and that um, represents about $700 thousand dollars. So one assistant principal for Ken Island High School. Currently Ken Island High School has one principal and two assistants, one of which is assigned to the annex, leaving only one assistant to handle the main building along with the responsibilities of athletic director. We're requesting four classroom teachers, one at Kent Island Elementary School um, for second grade, one math teacher for Centerville Middle School, and two teachers at Queen Anne's County High School, one for um, English Language Arts and Social Studies, so 0.5.5, and then one 1 1.0 uh, computer science teacher. So we'll continue to evaluate class sizes and um, the current use of our resources to ensure that we are using them most effectively. But I, I really do want to say um, that our, our schools have really been um, 
they've really been helpful in working with us and, and understanding the importance of presenting a budget that we believe is reasonable and attainable. Um, and so this is what we've come with. The additional um, positions, the additional three positions are in operation. So there's a position for a driver trainer to work with in the transportation department um, and two additional maintenance personnel. We haven't really added any staff to the maintenance department since we opened Kent Island High School. Um, and that added 385,000 square feet of facilities that have to be maintained. So in addition to the demands for an electrician and the additional technology in the classrooms, we really do need that position. So those responsibilities have significantly increased. This, this slide shows our contractual obligations. We reviewed requests and evaluated our five-year trend data. We observed several areas that required increases in funding. Um, legal fees were one of those areas. While it's difficult to determine the need for legal representation from one year to, to another, our trend data indicated that um, the amount currently budgeted was not adequate to cover our cost. The same held true for maintenance contract for general contracts for general repairs to buildings, and next year additional water testing is going to be required, as you know. We've requested funds for a third-party administrator for our 403B and 457 plans uh, because state laws continue to become more complicated and this is a needed service. The largest increase in contractual obligations is for software um, licenses. Each year since we began the one-to-one -one initiative, we've been purchasing the software licenses at the end of the previous year, and we may not be able to accommodate that this year. There's an operational cost and should be added in our budget. So when we when we do things like um, uh, catch up on 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 line items or, or account for funding for line items that really are short with attrition funds and those kinds of things at the end of the year, we really are covering up structural deficits. So when we don't adequately budget for line items, we are creating a situation where we have to go find money and we knew we needed to go find money because it's not adequately addressing our needs. And we certainly don't want to continue that practice. The second largest increase under contractual obligations is bus contracts. The contract with the four bus companies requires an annual adjustment based on the increase in CPIU over a 12-month period from January to January. <coughs> that increase is 2.2 percent, which equates to a little more than $105,000. Legal fees, um, the current budget is 60000 and we wanted to increase that by 10000 to 70000 Bus contracts currently $5,160,000, and we want to increase it to $5,265,000. Uh, Our testing contracts um, currently are budgeted at 98000 and we wanted to increase it to 122000 Software licenses, we needed to increase that by uh, 280000 and that's an increase of 210000 because it's only budgeted at $70,000. Our maintenance contracts, repairs to buildings, and current budget is about 145000 and we needed to increase that to one we We've got the, current, the ev environmental testing for the water testing, um, and so we needed to increase that by 10000 uh, maintenance contracts, and that's for gym floors and things of that nature. The current budget is 60000 We needed to increase it to 95000 The third-party administrator, that is a new line, and the <coughs> cost is $10,000. Under supplies and materials, again, based on our five-year trend data, custodial supplies have been um, over the current budget allocation for the last five years. Green cleaning, which is now a state regulation, is more expensive. And so uh, we also want to pay for, from this line, uniforms and shoes for our custodial personnel. Other charges, the increase in insurance costs are based on the projections received from uh, MABE, as you all well know, the group insurance pool. Employee benefits, payroll taxes are calculated based on salaries and wages. Mileage is to accommodate the one cent increase in the approved IRS standard mileage rate. And of course, we have included a $15,000 line here for early college tuition um, because we're expanding our offering to, of college courses and early college to students um, at the high school level which we shared a presentation last month. The next slide represents um, transfers. There is no increase in the equipment line. Uh, based on the costs associated with non-public placements and ages of students in those placements, we needed to increase the line item um, for this budget. 
and of course, the Midshore Special Education Consortium's FY18 budget proposal included an increase from the current amount allocated uh, for that service, to continue that service, I should say. This is the summary of the last five slides. So the total overall increase to, to our budget is $5,401,767. And you can see that it, the costs are broken out for salary increases, or certainly that's the estimate. Um, the cost of a lost step, the 2.2% for folks at the top of the scale, contracted services, supplies, other charges, uh, no increase for equipment, and the cost for transfers. Okay, so uh, requested increase in unrestricted revenue. So that five billion that we talked about, 5.4 million that we just talked about in the last slide. Um, uh, state sources, the state aid, 329,338. And local sources, which once again <laughs> represents fund balance, which we took from last year and need to replace. Then the uh, requested um, increase from the county is 5,336,842 required increase in MOE is $1,389,120. So our request over MOE will be $3,947,770, I'm sorry, $3,947,722. So uh, at this point, you know, it, it becomes a, a bit of a um, question. Are, are we asking for growth or, or status quo? And I could say a lot about that, but what I will say is that across the state, school superintendents are presenting their budget requests, and I, and I am part of that. Um, Queen Anne's County has pockets of poverty and suffers the ails similar to many other rural school districts. However, that's only part of our county story. The rest of the story boasts wealth, which was, is reflected in some of the slides that we just saw. It's reflected in the growth we see every day in this county. New courthouses built, roads are repaired, there's plans for a new library to come to uh, fruition. Many facets of this county reflect that we are in growth mode. And that's great because we need to attract businesses for economic development, we need to boost real estate sales, and we need to continue to grow our wealth in this county. But what we are offering in terms of improving our schools uh, looks like a different story, right? It's 2018, and this year represents the third year for which a request has been made for a computer science teacher at Queen Anne's County High School. That should not be. We talk about our motto, right, is we want to produce world-class students. In 2018, if we are to produce world-class students, we certainly have to offer them a pathway to learn computer science. That goes without saying. Ken Island High School has a great program for computer science, as they should. And the question becomes, is it equitable that we have one high school that has a program and not another? Now, this is not to say anything is wrong with Ken Island High School having that program, but what we're looking at is an, an equitable situation when we offer it at one school and we don't offer it at the other school. So we need to think about that. The community completed the budget survey this past fall, and those results were presented in January. Respondents clearly stated that they value low class size, more options for world classical languages, arts, and STEM programs for students. Um, but it is to my great disappointment that you do not see those programs specifically identified in this budget request because we want to certainly um, remain fiscally responsible we want to present a budget that is doable, 
but we have got to get ourselves to a position where we're able to offer our students new or improved programming in order to produce the students that we say we want to produce, which is world-class students. So moving forward in another day and time, we certainly want to be able to come back to those issues, those things that have been requested. We want to be sure that we are addressing our structural deficits that I mentioned a little bit earlier. When we fund lines that we know are inadequate, that presents a deficit, that we have got to get out of the practice of finding monies at the end of the year or hoping that we have attrition. And attrition really represents the difference in the salaries of maybe senior or tenured employees when they leave and, and the new ones that we hire that may not be at, a, at the higher salary. So we, it's not a good accounting practice to rely on those kinds of funds to fund our everyday line items. We absolutely must pay our employees. I began this budget process as a cheerleader to increase pay scales for support employees. Uh, as we know and was talked about earlier today by Ms. Fields, we have support employees that are below the poverty line, right? That should not be. Uh, I have spoken um, publicly about, you know, employees who are uh, making less than $10 an hour. These are employees with car payments and, and rent and mortgages, and we've got to do a better job of paying our employees. Uh, we have employees that work two and three jobs just to earn enough to, to pay their daily expenses. We have employees who are with us because of the in health insurance, but it may not be meeting their needs. We have teachers and administrators that work endless hours and take time and resources away from their own family to do more for our students. And it's commendable. And, and we get into this because we have a heart for children and we want to do what's right for children. But we do have expectations that we need to pay our employees. Every single one of them uh, deserves more. Uh, and, and, and more, I wish we could give them what they really deserve, but in education across this nation, we don't pay our educators uh, what they really are deserving of. And I know that we don't always have funds to pay, um, you know, the steps and things that, that we want to pay, but it is my responsibility to request them. So what I presented to you are uh, our budget requests for fiscal year 19. Uh, now, what I committed to our uh, elected officials, you included, is that we will be transparent about what we have to do. And this is, this is the facts only. Please recognize that, the facts. What we will need to do should we only receive maintenance of effort. So our request was 3.9. $3,947,722. Uh, the new positions would be 700000 If we were not able to get all of our requests, the first thing I would do would be to cut out those eight new positions. And if I cut out those eight new positions, that would leave a balance of $3,247,727. Now, each teaching position averages about $85,000. So if you look at that $3.2 million and divide that by 87,000, the cost of a teacher, that would mean that 38 positions would need to be cut if we get only funding level to maintenance of effort. Now what we're talking about is not people, not positions that are vacant. So last year, the school district got into a, a position where they needed to balance the budget. And so uh, Mr. Paluski was able to um, cut some positions that were vacant. He cut some central office positions so that we did not have to go to uh, school positions. And I know there was a big um, controversy over the media specialists. But what I'm saying to you is that there is no possible way that we can find $3.2 million to balance our budget without cutting positions that living, breathing, mortgage paying, car payment paying people sit in today. So some areas that we have considered uh, or, or just have to be put on the table, certainly uh, most of them I, I would like to think are, are not 
a place that we'd have to resort to, but this, these are these are some some considerations. So of course, some staffing reviews have to be done at all schools, and and if there are positions that are not fully u- utilized, then we certainly would need to cut some positions there with recommendations from principals. Healthcare coverage, uh, we pay 100% of healthcare for some um, plans, and I would recommend a 90/10 premium sharing, so that employees have some um, portion of that or 10% of that that they would have to pay. We would look at a um, option that you all looked at before, pay to play for athletics, uh, not funding a step, not funding COLA, uh, delaying the implementation of salary improvements, looking at furlough days, um, and certainly, which is a minuscule amount, but admission fees for students attending athletic events. Just some ideas for cost savings that have been, uh, that should be considered. So let's look at our construction fund. So a facility assessment was done in May 2016, and um, already we are a bit behind what our our plan, our 30-year blueprint, um, says that we need to do. So there are uh, multiple areas in which we received a uh, poor or failed rating, and those areas amount to about $1.2 million dollars. There are some ADA upgrades that need to be made at some of our schools um, in some um, in the area of the um, parking lots, curb cutouts, signage. Um, there are some um, athletic buildings, gutters, downspouts uh, that affect the building shell. And there are windows, doors, there are multiple replacements, things that have to be uh, repaired. There's some site work having to do with asphalt, overlay milling, um, drainage, and those kinds of things. Also, you're going to notice um, classroom technology. Our technology plan equates to about $1.3 million. It's actually $1,328,000. Um, and next year, we'll be in the fifth year of that technology plan. So we have to make some decisions about what we're going to do as we move forward for technology devices for our students. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, there are certain options that we certainly can look at, but there are about 2,200 devices for all of the middle school students plus the fifth grade at Sellersville Middle School and an extended warranty on teacher laptops for a year. So we're going to continue to work on that. There's no difference for leasing versus buying. I'm told uh, the leasing um, may cost us more, but uh, evidently it's a, a small difference. Most, but what it will do is it will uh, allow the opportunity for upgrades and to refresh um, devices that we do not, we would not have if we purchased them outright. So they're also considering. Um, instead of the bags, which some of the kids hate and some of the parents because they have told me so, um, instead of having those bags to install um, drop tech cases, which uh, are certainly much more durable, we need to um, have an active directory um, and there's a labor, there's a one-time labor cost to set that up. Maryland legislative auditors recommended that we replace Novell with a single sign-on for one password for multiple logins. It helps to control security with fire firewalls, uh, software security policies. Um, and uh, so those are, those are some of the, the things that needed to be considered when we look at our construction fund. Yep. So where are we now? So um, right now we're looking at uh, county work sessions as we move forward. They're, they're noted on the slide, March 20th, 27th, 29th, and April 3rd. April 11th is currently the date the county commissioners um, plan to release their budget. Uh, May 23rd is the date for adoption of the final budget and the tax rates. And if you would also note, April 24th, 25th, and 26th are the scheduled public hearings for the county's budget. So this evening you've received financial data for Queen Anne's County, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, Queen Anne's County Public Schools revenue projection, expenditure projections, and our budget request for FY19. And I am going to um, seek approval for this budget request uh, following any discussion. And before we have discussion, I'm going to ask that uh, the other members of the exec team join me with chairs so that we might be able to respond to any questions that you may have. <laughs> 